And we are live. Hey, folks, thanks for tuning in to the Ghost Show show a few days early. <laughs> um, to, uh, this is a special, well, let's be honest, we've inaugurated the Ghost Show podcast to uh, help us promote the transgressive horror anthology. But um, it's going to be an ongoing interest where we talk about horror movies. And wait, 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 I forgot. I have um, our very professionally done uh, opening music and graphic that I must play to convince people that we're a professional and high productions operation. So hang on one second. And- Sorry, Chris, I, that you off. <laughs> I think we only gave him like half the half the required amount of funk, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> I, I can put it back up at the end if you want. All right, good, good, good. That gives people something to look forward to. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And today we are very privileged to have with us a um, couple guests. Cynthia Celeste Miller, directly beneath me in the Brady Brunch grid, has often graced our show. Thanks for coming back. Um, people probably know you best from Spectrum Games. You're cutting out a little. Oh, sorry. Um, can you give a brief introduction for any uh, any uh, poor uncultured listeners who might not be familiar with your uh, with your resume? Yeah. Um, so we specialize in games that uh, faithfully emulate genres within context of the rules and presentation. Um, we have games that I can really count off the top of my head. Some of the ones is Cartoon Action Hour. Uh, Urban Manhunt, On the Air, Old Time Radio, Slasher Flick, Macabre Tales, Stories from the Dead, uh, and more. All right. <laughs> Retro Star. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to say hi to uh, Sean Vera, one of our regular commentators who is there today. Thanks, Sean. Always good to see you, sir. Yeah. And um, joining us um, for the first time in a few years um, is Mr. Jason Walters of uh, Indie Press Revolution. Good to have you, sir. Thank you. And uh, you have a bunch of other credentials that we should probably mention, right? Uh, yeah, I am the uh, president of Hero Games, uh, long-term publisher of Champions and many other things. Uh, and I am also the owner of my own imprint, High Rock Press, that pretty much uh, publishes things my friends design. That's, that's largely what my imprint does too, sir. So I, I understand that business. <laughs> and last but not least is... Um, the man of the hour, the, uh, the guy without whom there would no be, there would be no ghost show. Uh, the ghost show boss, Christopher McLaughlin. How you doing, sir? I I wish that I had thought about how this Kickstarter would run th- run through the end of semester grades. So <laughs> my my life is like I wake up, I'm in a Zoom meeting, I'm not off for a second, I'm in one of these podcasts, which is great. I just. <laughs> I wish I'd had a little more distance there, looking back. But but that but that really that's 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 Monday morning quarterbacking right there. Other than that, I'm pleased this punch to be here and so, surrounded by such wonderful friends and talents. Indeed, indeed. And uh, just look it out of the way quick. Uh, here is a Kickstarter link. If you do a, so, a search for transgressive horror on Kickstarter, you'll find that. And this is a collection of essays by a, a whole bunch of talented folks, uh, like our two guests tonight. Um, uh, and how would you describe it succinctly, Chris? What, what, what's what's the best uh, tagline for this book? Well, I rounded up 28 of the most dangerous writers in the business today, and I gave them a very, very, very dangerous amount of freedom and a very, 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 very daring and rule-breaking question. What is your favorite horror film that either breaks genre rules or writes a whole new set of genre rules? And then I completely bucked the, the trend of uh, publishing that, I'd ex- that I've experienced for the last five years, and I just let my writers write. And I got back some incredible insights into films, things that things that I never would have noticed. You know, it's just I gambled on talent, and I came up a winner. And I'm and I'm really really hoping we get those last 92 backers, and I can show the world what an amazing book this is, and how insanely brilliant and insightful and wise and funny these wonderful people have been about the about these uh, films ranging from classic to dodgy. Hey, I'm gonna try to log out for I log to come back in. Hold on just a second. No worries, Cynthia. We have been plagued with technical difficulties so far this show, so um, bear with us, folks. I think things are going to be okay. And um, I blame the Russians. How do you define dodgy? 
<laughs> dodgy yeah. be, being being films. Uh, well, I mean, there the horror film ranges from like these big, expensive, you know, major studio films like The Exorcist to you know guys who scraped together twenty grand and somebody told them, well, you know, you make a horror movie, you always make your money back. You know, so yeah, I mean, they're they're you know, I I think I think like an invasion of the blood farmers, which started out as a science fiction film until they realized they couldn't afford like actual special effects, so they got a good deal on bibbed overalls, and their alien invaders became vengeful modern druids because they could afford druids. All right. Um, and, and, and 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 I I I bought the Blu-ray because I wanted to check out a story I'd always heard about it. I had always heard that most of the actors were paid in beer and story accurate, myth confirmed. You 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 got the Blu-ray? <laughs> how can I turn down? How can I turn down most of the cast paid in beer? Come on. <laughs> Do we have a trailer for this? Uh, I don't know if they can afford one. I tell you what, you talk, you talk to these wonderful people. I'll reach back here and get what well, we can. We can at least show the cover. You talk to these wonderful people while I show the world my back. Uh, there, there is an invasion of the Blood Farmers trailer. Oh, you're kidding! Uh, <laughs> I'll run that. No, no all right. Um, we want to. Why are we talking about this now? You guys mind if we run this now? Just to... yeah, roll, roll it. Sounds like a classic. <laughs> I feel like we're doing MSTK, MSTK 3000, but okay, we, we will do that. I've got, oh, God, the Chris, this looks terrible. This looks really bad. Uh, is that a disco ball up close? I, I think Does it, it show? Is. Oh, no. Oh. They, they kind of look like Mennonites. <laughs> did, did, he, did, he just, did he just shoot the phone? Oh, okay. Yes. Druids. They're, they, I swear they're druids. <laughs> you don't want to know where that ho hose goes. Well, it, it, oh, well, oh, oh, no goats were hurt in the making of this. <laughs> That's some fascinating Kool Aid. Uh, <laughs> there's some serious scenery chewing going on there. Yeah, and there, there's that, and I, and I think every penny of the thirty-five grand they spent on this is right there on the screen. <laughs> This makes me feel better about all my oh, failed okay, creative endeavors. Go. Okay, good. <laughs> all right. Wait a minute. Is that a glass coffin? Yes. How did, yeah. they, afford, how did they afford a glass coffin on this project? Uh, they knew a guy. Oh, <laughs> wow. Oh, <laughs> uh, we got some Ed Wood acting on here. That's good. <laughs> got the ominous slow rise. <laughs> Well, when you run out when you run out of community theater, you go with the people that'll work for beer. That's not community theater. Okay, PG. <laughs> how is that PG? <laughs> it was it was a different time. It was with a different Marta's time. Of, oh, sorry. With Marta's <laughs> the hands of fate, uh, the highest paid person in the whole movie was Jackie Naiman, the little girl who got paid a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and the dog. The dog actually was given a bag of dog food. The dog had the best paid. agent. It's <laughs> great. Um, I, I can't top that. So how about we talk about uh, Frankenstein in 1931 with uh, Jason? What do you say, Jason? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, you want to roll the trailer? Yep, there we go. Oh, here we go. I can put the sound on it if you want. I'm pretty sure you're not going to hit me with the C&D for this one. <laughs> <laughs> or if you want, uh, yeah, let me, I'll turn on really soft. Let me just do that. I got to uh, share the audio. When this dead hand moved, the monster created by a man they called Mad is turned <clears throat> to strike terror into the hearts of men. Can you guys hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay. To shock women to uncontrolled hysteria. Elizabeth. To 
prey upon the innocence of children. This is the story you've heard about, talked about. The spine-tingling, blood-chilling story that stuns your emotions. Frankenstein. Don't touch them! <laughs> Spoiler, it's a dummy. Uh, <laughs> they're not lying. Carmoth really is good. Yes. It's, um, yeah, I, I always found that one oddly compelling, even, even though it's, you know, you can... You can kind of see the seams here and there. Uh, Jason, what, what drew you to this movie? Why did you want to write about it? Well, I think I think the first thing, if we're going to talk about it in the context of being uh, like a transgressive film, I think the first thing we need to do is kind of empty the last hundred or so years kind of out of our minds. Forget that you've ever seen Frankenberry or uh, Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein or Herman Munster. Kind of push all that out of your mind. Forget about that. And then also equally importantly, push out of your mind all the mad scientists you've seen since then. Like, like, no Lex Luthor, you know, no Elon Musk, <laughs> you know, <laughs> forget, forget all about those people. This is, you're going into a theater in 1931, and this is your first Frankenstein's monster, and this is your first mad scientist. Um, and then think about it in terms of being a film about child abuse, because that's really what it is. Um, there's a lot of things kind of grafted into this film that I think Hollywood made the director, James Whale, who's a, a completely fascinating figure. I think there's stuff he had to stick in or else it wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna, you know, get onto the screen. So you've got a lot of sort of corny romance and you got some comedy characters and stuff. But if you really look at the film, you can see like a pure horror film that's all kind of Jacob's ladders and necromancy and hunchbacks being whipped by upper class you know, aristocrats and uh, you know just terror children being drowned without any of that. It's kind of like they stuck another film into that film. But if you if you let go of that, you're seeing a film that is very much about the worst possible sort of parent, a parent who not only is abusive towards their child but lets others be abusive towards their child uh, and who is unstable themselves, not in control. Uh, and uh, in the end, the way, J the way James Whale wanted to finish the film was they both die and that's it. Like there's a whole additional five minutes of the film <laughs> that when he showed it to the theater, this is typical Hollywood, they looked at it and they went, yeah, this is great, except uh, it doesn't have a happy ending. And to which a whale apparently went, yeah, yeah, no, it doesn't have a happy ending. It's not a happy story. <laughs> they said, yeah, no, it, need, it needs to have a happy ending, um, which is why they film an additional five minutes with a guy that's not, oh, let me look up the actor's name. Uh, the Burgermeister? Oh, no, no, the, the Baron. Uh, Colin Clive plays yes. Dr. Frank. Yes. But because it's an American film, he's like, he's like Henry Frankenstein. <laughs> and uh, but Colin Clive, who was a notorious alcoholic, was uh, both acting in a play in London and on a bender, and they couldn't get him back. So they they took like this may actually be true, but you know the old thing about uh, Plan Nine from Outer Space. It's like the chiropractor, or yes. whatever. It like really was maybe James Whale's chiropractor or something like that which is why you never see his face in the final five minutes. He's turned away, <laughs> looking away from the camera, and you just see his cool 1930s slicked back pomade hair. Uh, they don't want you to know it's not Colin Clive because he's already left. Um, but they tag that in. Uh, there's, it's kind of, what was the last time any of you guys like, like watched it? I mean, it's kind of a crazy... It's been a while for me. Probably yeah. It, 20 years, 15 years? If you watch it at the beginning... It starts out with these crazy psychedelic kind of eyes. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Did we just lose Jason? He froze up. Yeah, he froze up for me too. 
talking about crazy psychedelic eyes. <laughs> okay, well, wait, well, wait uh, for him to come. Oh, there Jason, he is. You're back. So, yeah, yeah. You're back. And, and so immediately you have you have oh, throughout the film, Doctor Frankenstein has this hunchback assistant who's played by a character actor. His name was uh, let me look it up here real quick. A great actor. He does a really good job. Uh, Fritz. He's not called uh, Igor, by the way. Wait for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great character actor of his own. Um, and man, does he get abused. It's just abused, <laughs> like abusing the handicapped again and again and again, nonstop. Um, and uh, uh, the first thing they're doing is rot stealing bodies. That's the first. And they're not even stealing them. They're stealing them like literally the family leaves the grave digger finishes the grave and they like pop out from behind tombstones and start digging it back up again uh frankenstein makes his hunchback to system climb up on a gallows and cut a guy down he doesn't want to do it they're stealing they're stealing bodies immediately um they're sewing them together uh it, 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 again all kinds of wrong oh oh the the, 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 the cinematography is really interesting mm. it looks kind of like I hate to say it looks like high noon, but it kind of looks like a lot of like shadows and that weird. You all might know more about this than me. That weird, that weird background they have in films of the pyramid the period that it's yeah sort of you lit but gray yeah like it's like a stage effect yeah you you um, definitely see you definitely see the influence from from the German German silent cinema it, oh, it yeah, is. It, it's all it's almost like you know Nosferatu and Cabinet of Dr. Caligari made safe for an American audience. Yeah, sure, because the Nazis were busy chasing all those people out of Europe and to the United States and then not allowing horror to be made in Germany for like thirteen years. Yeah, so, I, I was I was I was blessed to meet Kurt Siodmak, who wrote The Wolfman in most of the forties universals. And uh he told wow. this story he told this story about his his take on winding up in America and making all these classic films films because he was fleeing the nazis and he said and he said i have big house on beach and every morning i get up and toast the sunshine and go thank you hitler you son of a bitch <laughs> um that's hard to top chris yeah, yeah that, that's kind of the showstopper right there i think we're done thanks everybody for coming out <laughs> sorry jason go ahead uh uh yes so you've got these intertwined themes You've also got the theme of uh, man defying God, because because mm -hmm. Frankenstein is pretty straightforward that he's attempting to defy <coughs> God. I think he does actually say God, but he definitely says nature or province. Like I am doing a thing that 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 men are not allowed to do. But you there, know there uh, is a there is line. Yeah, in the, in the original release, he's he, he's he he says now I know what it's like to be God, and that that yeah. got cut after like uh, uh, until they put it back for home video like 60 years later okay, the picture seeing that in the theater in chattanooga in 1931 <laughs> no kidding you know that's got to be a lot of people's you know back then some of their very first exposure to what would be considered blasphemy on film uh i would bet that that's one of the earliest mm -hmm. i mean not necessarily the earliest one there but for a lot of people that was their first exposure to that sort of uh right you know that style of, of story that would make sense uh and it's it's they have you know this is not uncommon in the movies of the time uh i remember seeing other movies like uh the, the probably the greatest all of gangster films of all time public enemy where they have a just they have a warning at the beginning right the studio head i think the studio head in the <laughs> literally comes out on a stage and warns you not to watch the film like the head yeah. of universal um <laughs> so I, I i guess that wasn't an unusual technique but man if you if you put yourself back a hundred years that must have been kind of mind-blowing like wow they're telling me not to watch this <laughs> now i gotta watch <laughs> it's, um, uh, it's good sales uh, right yeah yeah uh sales work is eternal um <laughs> but uh yeah I, I think i mean i say a lot more in my essay uh, but I think that basically sums it up. You've got a bunch of levels of transgression. Um, there is a lot of, of theories about what James Whale was or was not attempting to say in the film. Um, 
there's I, I guess I'm not an expert on this, but there's a whole kind of body of queer theory built around what may what whale may have been saying in the film. Um, I'm not I'm not sure about that because whales lover of 23 years said no, it wasn't wasn't doing that. Um, but you know, who, who, who knows? Um, I will say, I think with some confidence that whale was very touchy about class. He was British mm -hmm. and he was middle class, middle class guy made good in an upper class world. And he, he really had some issues about class. So I think with, with Dr. Frankenstein's treatment of, uh, of Fritz, the hunchback, you may actually be seeing him inject something about that directly. Uh, but that's conjecture on my part. Uh, Cynthia, you got, any, you got any insights on this? It has been so long since I've seen it. I'm like remembering this stuff as you're talking about it. Like, oh, okay, I think I may remember that. So no, I'm, I'm really not. Uh, I have seen it probably three or four times, though. I mean, but like, the, like I said, the last time, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, so... My memory's a little bit. I'm kind of wanting to go and rewatch it now. <laughs> yeah, it's worth it. It's it's worth the time. Uh, you, your time will not be wasted. Uh, there's actually uh, Whale himself is a really interesting guy. You don't really think much about men being openly gay in World War One, but there's James Whale. You know, never hiding it. Um, not through his whole life. Uh, and uh, they made a really interesting movie about him in 2015 called Gods and Monsters that is about that. yeah James Whale at the very end of his life uh, let me see here it stars um, Three and the it stars yeah Ian McClellan as as James Whale and it has uh, in it as his nurse and uh, I saw that it was really interesting it's a good <clears throat> film it's worth, worth the watch um so yeah, uh, really, really interesting layers of possible deliberate and, and, and undeliberate subtext to Frankenstein. I think a lot of people focus more on Bride of Frankenstein, um, which is kind of even more, uh, it's more, less subdued, more over the top, uh, and every bit is iconic. Um, but for this essay, I just focus in on the original one and why it was so mind-blowing at the time, I think for audience. Cool, cool. Um, I got to thinking, there's been so many takes on Frankenstein over the years. I mean, it's not, it's not quite as many as Dracula or Sherlock Holmes, but um, there was a BBC series um, uh, with Sean Bean. Did you guys see this one? Uh -uh. I missed that one. Yeah, it's, 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 it's that rare Sean Bean Frank, uh, show where he does, well, he dies like in episode two and then he comes back. Um, <laughs> no. It still counts. It still yeah. counts. As the Frankenstein Chronicles, uh, BBC, uh, oh, just yeah. Okay. yeah, it um, it uh, I like Sean Bean, and it helps, and it starts out really strong, but I don't think they got past the idea that Frankenstein is living in London, you know, reincarnating people, and um, once he they kill Sean Bean and bring him back, they don't really have a lot to do with it. It just kind of meanders along, and then petters after two seasons, but. Um, I don't know. It, it, it was interesting. I... <laughs> well, if you really, really want to see uh, like the most out there Frankenstein, tra uh, you know, change of venue like that without without getting into like like truly weird stuff like like hardcore porn or something like that, uh, there is an obscure Canadian film called Doctor Frankenstein on Campus, where. Uh, Dr. Doctor, Doctor, uh, Doctor Frankenstein becomes the coolest guy in this late 60s, early 70s campus because he's the leader of the student unrest and he's using like the student demonstrations and the violence on campus to cover up the fact that, you know, like the dem like the demonstrators that get that get killed or injured in the violence, he's, he's harvesting the parts from them to build his monster. So uh, it's, 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 it's such a hilariously subversive idea and lower and i the copy i have of it was it was recorded off of uh canadian cinemax in like 83 it's just barely watchable but i i didn't care it was just such a crazy idea i had i had to write it all the way to it all the way to its insane conclusion but yeah but but, but dr frankenstein campus radical i thought mm -hmm. there you go this 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 I, may we may have hit the limit here 
I, I did enjoy, and if we're speaking of, of sort of the uh, British television series Frankenstein, I did enjoy Penny Dreadful, where mm -hmm. Frankenstein's monster is like, like Doctor Frankenstein is definitely enamored with his very handsome monster he's made. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if no one's ever seen the wonderful uh, wrestling film Against All Monsters, uh, <laughs> Elvis Santo yes. film, where I think I think oh. both of them is back in the moment of and are like cruising around in a dune buggy together. Uh, I don't remember who's driving. Um, <laughs> that's also worth it. And then, of course, you know, and his hero's journey, El Santo, has to defeat each one in turn. That's sort of part of the hero's journey. I'm having trouble. First. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, I was just having trouble finding the trailer for that one. <laughs> Against All Monsters? Yeah. I think that might have been the first El Santo movie, or in fact, the first luchador based movie at all that I have ever seen, if I recall. Oh, that's, it's that's not one really one. close to it. It's a little. It's a little lacking in midget wrestlers. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, most really films are. Good wrestling films with lots of quality midget wrestlers. And in fact, uh, I don't mean to sidebar too much, um, but the original uh, Mexico City uh, Midget Wrestling League actually sp sprang out of the first Champions of Justice film where they wrote kind of, kind of henchmen midget wrestlers into it. And so Santo and Blue Demon and Mil Mascarez and all these guys had to train all these guys to be the villainous midget wrestling henchmen. And they were so good, they were like, hey, let's, uh, we can make a thing out of this. Show business. I kind of wanted to see a movie about the making of that movie. <laughs> Me too. There, there, there are interviews with, with, uh, with, for example, Blue Demon in old age. He gave a bunch mm -hmm. of interviews. Still in his mask, but you know, brush up on your Spanish because they're not subtitled. I have them, yeah. but you know, you know, it's slow going for me. Okay, I misspoke earlier about the Frankenstein Chronicles. I wanted to correct myself. Um, actually, the conceit they have in there is that uh, Mary Shelley was telling um, a slightly disguised true story, and that mm -hmm. her husband and some people she hung out with were actually, you know, doing that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And wow. I, um, so wow. yeah, um, you guys know there was a found footage Frankenstein film. A few years ago, I think by law there had to be. Yeah, it's um, I can show that it's it's as bad as you think it would be. It's during that big boom and uh, direct to streaming. Here we go. It's uh basically the the Blair Witch Project, but there is one kid on on the crew who his last name is Frankenstein, and um, he's got his great 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 grandfather's journal, and he knows that you know Adam still out there somewhere so they, 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 they go to the arctic with their cameras and their tents and it's pretty much the blair witch but with more snow and uh oh. you know for, from the makers of the last exorcism oh, why can't they leave a fella alone <laughs> <laughs> do, you think, do you think the makers of the of, of the frankenstein theory and the last exorcism also also have like have like the next psycho or you know the Idaho Chainsaw Massacre on their resume too. They're probably just calling the guys at the asylum trying to get a script meeting. I don't know. Well, God. <laughs> Night of the Dead who are alive. Anyway, it, this trailer goes on for another minute, and it's all just like this right here. So, ah, okay. Bad things happening in the snow. It's supposed to be the Arctic Circle, but you can tell it's probably somewhere in Canada. Montana. Yeah, maybe yeah. Montana too. So. Oh, and of course, there has to be a night vision scene because, yes, of course, there is. So, yeah. Was there anywhere to go after Andy Warhol's Frankenstein? After you, after you do it in 3D and that, and that, and that one notorious line from that film, you let it go. Move on to something else. You know? You know. I've never actually seen that. Oh, my. Well, here you go. I take, as soon as this podcast is over, there you go. You know what to do. Or two of the trailer. Andy I don't think Warhol's. It's X, the, the movie's X rated. I don't know if we can get away with it. Oh, uh, bro. The trailer doesn't have that. Maybe it does. There's a one minute restored trailer on YouTube. Oh, God. Okay. All right. Um, well, you know, we're talking about it, so we should look at it, right? It's a visual medium. Yeah. Uh, hang on a second. Da -da -da -da. The anticipation is delicious, huh? Okay, here we go. And full screen. 
well. They re- it, it, it's, it was theatrically released in 3D, if you want to know why you're getting this stuff popping out of the screen at you. Oh, that explains that scene right there. Yes. Velvet Underground. You know, I've never actually seen any film shot by Andy Warhol. I just heard that he was making movies, but... Well, this was boat. actually this, this was actually more Paul Morrissey's work, but he knew that there was box office into trading off his association with Andy Warhol. This looks really Warhol, bad, Chris. It uh, well, the key line of dialogue in it is is Udo Kier does something that earns the X rating to to his creation, and he looks at his assistant and he says, "To know life, Otto, you must first fuck life in the gallbladder." What? Yes. <laughs> you know the special <laughs> effects aren't bad. I mean, you know, it, the, that, and the three D is really good. I, I I learned something new in this podcast every episode. Okay. All right, but but not a good date movie. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, okay, I'll tell you what. I tell you what. I tell you what. If 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 your date gets into this, just marry them on the spot. Just go right to city hall. Oh, I bet my life partner should love it. Actually. You t- you you two restore my faith and romance and love <laughs> every single day. Hello, Scott. So hey, you know, the idea that Mary Shelley was telling thinly disguised truth is, uh, I mean, there is some validity to that in that she was spending her time around a lot of monsters. Mm. Uh, you yes. know, Byron died heroically fighting for Greek inter- independence, but pretty much a monster mm-hmm. or the first modern celebrity, depending on how you look at it or both. Uh, Shelley himself, kind of a monster or mm-hmm. her husband ish. Mm-hmm. Um, God, who was locked up in that castle with them as well? The guy that wrote the vampire, like the first vampire novel. Polidori. Polidori was locked up there during the, the, the year when Krakatoa went off and there was no harvest and, Byron took his considerable money from selling off Sherwood Forest, and they uh, they locked themselves up in that chalet on a lake in Switzerland for like a year, or a winter, or something. I, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah, pretty pretty much. You're locking yourself up with some pretty monstrous people. So, good time to write or run for your life. <laughs> oh wow. Well, speaking of running for your life, um, Cynthia, do we want to talk about uh, Black Christmas from 1974? Always. <laughs> okay. Let me uh, cue that up. Sorry, and um, once again, for our, any el- uncultured people who might have stumbled across our podcast on Facebook, <laughs> could, you, uh, could you set this up for me? Sure. Okay. So Black Christmas is, it, a, I won't call it the first slasher movie. I'll call it the first modern slasher movie. Um, it really set the stage for what was going to be, what was going to come later in the decade and then into the next decade and beyond in that it created this formula that has since been repeated over and over, twisted, turned, subverted, what have you. But the reason I chose this specifically is because it takes all that is sacred about Christmas and the, the comfort and joy that the holiday brings, and then it just completely contorts it. <clears throat> so, I mean, it does. It, they, they delight in perverting what is, for many people, a very, you know, sacred holiday. And, <laughs> and in ways that's, that's, and the movie is oddly relaxing. And I know that sounds crazy, but people who've seen it know what I'm talking about. It's, it's oddly relaxing in that it doesn't have this frantic pacing, um, and except for in spurts and spells. But most of it is a very nice, calm environment, which actually the, you know, the contradiction there of, between that and the horror that unfolds as the movie progresses is actually makes it all the scarier. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's surprising what a what a how what, what how how this is cinematic comfort food to so many people. Like for instance, our our local Alamo Draft House every December they break out. You know they're going to show White Christmas, they're going to show a Christmas story, they're going to show Elf, and they always show Black Christmas. Right. <laughs> um, 
fun fact on that is that whenever my life partner is having trouble sleeping, she suffers from, from pretty bad, uh, what's it called, where you can't really sleep. Insomnia. There we are. Uh, she suffers from that really bad, and whenever it gets too much, she will go and watch this movie, and it will relax her to the point where she can often go back to sleep. That's a fact. <laughs> I find the good the first Star Trek movie is good for that for me, but uh, <laughs> that was low hanging fruit. I'm, I apologize for that joke. That was too easy. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good, but no, the, the movie actually uh, does a lot of interesting things, and I talk about it obviously more in depth in the essay. But one thing I want to bring up at least briefly here is the score, or mm -hmm. kind of lack thereof. I mean, there is a score, um, but it's used sparingly, and it's it's more discordant noise to punctuate moments than it is a traditional score. Um, you just hear like, and it's, it creates a sense of discomfort that I don't think I have before or since ever encountered in any movie. Um, and then Can I ask will, you, huh? I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, they will often juxtapose that with like, there's one scene, one of my favorite scenes in which, Somebody's getting brutally murdered at the same time as you're hearing Christmas carolers outside and they're cutting back and forth and it's just <laughs> masterful. <clears throat> so let me, let me ask you, mm -hmm. what am I looking at right now on the screen? Okay. You are looking at the first victim, uh, Claire. Uh, <clears throat> she was killed pretty early on. And it sets the stage for all the events that come. And the the killer, Billy, who brought her up to the attic, and because he suffocated her with the plastic you're seeing over her mouth as she was going into her closet, because she was packing to to go home for a holiday. And uh, he killed her, and put the that's that's her seeing her through the window in the attic. Mm -hmm. Which, oddly enough, even after the police are there and stuff late in the movie, they never find her body. Mm. Like, it's in the attic! It's not even that hard to get to! It's not even hidden! It's right by the freaking window! But, you know, Isn't it John Saxon, one of the police? Maybe that's why they don't find her. <laughs> yes, that's that's probably true. But the funny story with him, and I don't think I... I don't think I mentioned this in the, the essay, but uh, he was actually a last-minute replacement for another well-known actor. Oh, what's his name? Montgomery Cliff. Uh, oh. <laughs> really? Oh, really? I'd pay to see that version too. <laughs> we can't right? get Cliff. Let's get John Saxon. <laughs> well, he was he was available at the last minute. He flew out there and just like almost immediately hit the ground running uh, because the prob it was a real sad story actually, and I cannot remember the dang actor all of a sudden. But he was, he's been in a lot of, like, film noir and, and all sorts of stuff. <clears throat> I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, he was flown in and everything. And uh, but his he was in the earlier stages of dementia. Mm -hmm. And he was, it was clear, because his, his manager, whatever, set it up for him. And, and it was pretty clear that he was not going to be able to, and he started crying, I guess. It was. It was a really, really sad scene, and and so they, yeah, they were able to get John Saxon in, who just killed it, by the way. I mean, <laughs> he just owns this movie from top to bottom, in my opinion. Well, him and Margot Kidder, uh, but they, he really did a good job, especially considering the circumstances. Hey, you're going to be in this movie. What's the script? Well, you have to get it when you get here. Boom! What the? <laughs> we're filming today, so he did a really good job. Um, and he's actually a competent cop in this one, aside from, you know, what I mentioned before. <laughs> uh, his underling, on the other hand, was less competent. He was, there's a, my favorite scene in the whole movie revolves around his incompetence and naivete. <laughs> but, yeah, I know Chris is chuckling. He knows what yes. I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's something dirty, isn't it? <laughs> Um, well, if it'll help us fund, yes, 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 let's, yes, let's pretend it's very controversial and we need yes. to be banned. 
Uh, it, this movie was actually at least one of the first movies to use the C word. Speaking mm. of controversy, and must... that alone got it banned. I believe. <laughs> That one. That one. Canada. That's where they had to shoot it. Canada. It's the first one to actually use the word Canada on, on screen. Yeah. Oh, Canada. Yeah. So, uh, so there's a lot of reasons that this movie broke ground. And I, that wasn't the first movie, by the way. And yes, I checked that out. But it was one of the earliest mm -hmm. instances of that word being used in cinema. Hmm. Um, but the way it was used is probably more shocking than how it was used because in the middle of an obscene phone call in which they actually had, I think, two to three people actually acting the parts out. It was supposed to be one person, Billy, doing all the voices, but they actually had several actors. And I think the main one was actually did it while standing on his head to create a certain, yeah, I mean, it's they went to great lengths. And the phone calls were legitimately disturbing. I mean, even even by today's standard, you listen to it and you get the willies. I mean, it's not one of those things where it would have been shocking in 1974, but in 2021 it was like old hat or just like, okay, yeah, this must be what Grandpa liked to watch when he was a kid. Uh, it, it never came off that way. In, the, in fact, the whole movie is you know, uh, actually pretty timeless. You know, a modern audience—the one thing they're gonna—they're not gonna relate to is—is—is is the, is the obscene phone calls. They're just gonna be sitting there thinking, like, "Wait, somebody keeps calling these people, and it's not about extending their car warranty." What, what's this? I don't get it. Why didn't they just look at the caller ID? You know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Cynthia, I just—I just noticed something watching this trailer. Uh -huh. uh, maybe you could comment on it. You remember in Grindhouse, the pretend movie trailers in the middle? Uh huh. Do you think maybe the movie Thanksgiving is attempting to look like Black Christmas? Like the trailer for the pretend slasher film? I think you could be right, actually. Um, it's been a while since I've seen that, but I've, I've watched that over and over because I love it so much. Um, but I bet you're right. I bet there is some uh, influence there. there. Well, more than influence. Uh, straight out uh, homage. I would agree with that, actually. Pretty cool. Now I'm going to go watch it again. Well, you guys are giving me all sorts of stuff to watch. And uh, Sean Vera is pointing out that, as a Canadian, I forget how much has been filmed up here. Shouldn't I shouldn't. I have a cousin who's a cameraman on Supergirl. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, I actually found a blog just now called uh, Can Exploitation that's um, oh, yeah. <laughs> talking about all the great horror movies that were made um, in the Great White North. My, my, my two favorite new fil film terms I've learned lately was Can Exploitation and uh, I was also delighted to find that there's a van exploitation genre out there. Really? Yeah, I'm thinking like volume 87 will be doing like most transgressive van van exploitation films. Can you can you name one right now so I can try Super to find van. something? Super van. Uh, and also the van. The van, yes, yes, probably the for, for me the Citizen Kane of van van exploitation movies. Yes. This is a thing that exists. Okay. <laughs> There's even RV exploitation movies. <laughs> okay, I dubbed it. Okay, that's I totally coined the term. But there's actually like a rash of like three or four of these things that's that's come out, and like a couple of them are surprisingly good, and not in a so bad they're a good way. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I'm 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 cutting off at the hills have eyes. That's all I need right there. That's <laughs> yes. That's probably where it started. That's the beginning of <laughs> our exploitation right there. Yes, the, the trailer for the people where, you know, the title Chevy Van or Super Van, not enough to get into the theater. Here you go. We got a trailer for this. <laughs> this is like the prequel to Nomad Land, only in <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that the RV from Stripes? The urban uh, assault vehicle. It, it, it's close. That this is this was done by George Barris, who did the who did the Batmobile and for the for the sixties um for the for the sixties Batman show. And another one of his. I I you know, Chris, I always learn something new on all of these podcasts, and um, <laughs> I, I didn't know this was a genre or that this was a film. That's um <laughs> I I gotta earn that professor title every day. One way or the right. other. And Is don't this... forget RV exploitation. I'm making it happen. 
Okay, I'm pointing <laughs> at it's gonna happen. <laughs> or after Smokey and the Bandit. I mean, does this or Cannonball Run? Does this predate those movies, or is it kind of inspired by? That. It would have been. It would have been. If I remember correctly, Superman. Superman is seventy-seven, and I think. I think. I think the van might be seventy-six. Yeah. So it's definitely definitely of that zeitgeist. That's there is a new guess. movie called newer movie called The Van. Also, that's. I think it's called The Van. The Irish one with Cole Yeah, that's huh? what I was thinking. Well, it's like serious and about feelings and stuff. I. No, there's no way to relate to that. Horror. Uh but the well, van actually kills people and such. It was too bad. <laughs> okay, now um, you have my interest. Yeah, no, seriously. I think it's called The Van. It's been a while, like a couple of years since I've seen it, but it's really good. Like, Ooh. I expected it to be really bad good, but it was just good. Um, so I don't know if I was disappointed or delighted by that fact, but I totally expect it to be just so bad. Like, there's a movie right now called Slacks. S-L-A-X-S. <laughs> And I was expecting to be a total killer tomatoes type of <laughs> and it was actually like good. And I'm like, what's going on here? So um, th this this is the van. This is a trailer for the van. And um, actually, this isn't because this is a trailer for the commitments. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Terribly sorry. Because, because the van literally is a sequel to the Snapper, the Cole Meany film, The Van. Really? Is a sequel to The Snapper. And Cole Meany was in the commitment to somebody's dad. Right yeah. there, one of the best drunken, eight-month-old pregnant, uh, eight pregnant women scenes you'll you'll ever see. Yeah, that's a, yeah, I Irish humor. Uh, Cindy Lauper. <laughs> oh, it's it's an Irish fan movie. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. yes. In, in drunken, yes. eight-month pregnant. I'm starting to feel like Count Floyd that I've built up this film, and it's like, like ooh, ooh, kids, there could be something scary in that van. Full meaning. Stay tuned. Um, okay, I think I can probably stop the trailer now. It's uh, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's a pretty. My apologies to any uh, listeners from Ireland who might be on there. I love your fine country. Then there three times. It, it it is a lot of fun. Uh, we have an occasional podcast guest uh, goes by Patty Finn as his uh, his podcast name, and he's a writer from uh, Northern Ireland, and a lovely fellow. Actually, the friendliest place I've been to in Ireland was Belfast. That was, that was a joke. But. I, well, you, you cut out for a second. I'm sorry. You got to say it again. What was that? Uh, no, that's okay. I think I'll pass. All right. No worries. Um, did you guys know there's a movie called CB Hustlers? What's that again? CB Hustlers? Yeah, it's it, it's listed on, on Wikipedia as a van exploitation film, but arguably it's more of a a trucking exploitation <laughs> film. Oh well, we're Wikipedia. not going to revisit that classic argument again, are we? <laughs> Is this the place and time, Chris? We, I... <laughs> I think we're trying to sell a horror book, aren't we? <laughs> hey, that looks pretty horrific to me, in spite of itself. <laughs> oh my god. That is on her shirt. What was that? <laughs> not, not under it, but on it. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa, whoa. Hey, there you go. Hey, 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 hey. There you go. Sorry. Sorry. There you go. I wasn't you, trying you to. And your, you and your van exploitation, young man. And I wasn't. exploitation. <laughs> Keep trying, Cynthia. You'll make it You'll make it happen. Just <laughs> a little bit harder. Okay. So we've been talking for about now. Wasn't there a fine comic book genre of like trucker exploitation, like trucker superheroes? U.S. What was it? Um, U.S. Marvel. One. Yeah, U.S. Uh, one. Ah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He had the special powers was he had CBs in his uh, CB ability to broadcast CD CB signals from his head. No equipment needed. And the I don't know if it was a genre, but. <laughs> and the incredibly obscure Marvel hero Razorback. Yeah. Yeah, that was he was Spider Man's friend, right? Yep. Yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah. And yes, his indeed. superpower was he had a truck, right? Well, he had he had a he had a, he had a truck, and also in his giant Razorback head, he had a CB radio receiver in there. Did, that didn't was they the... also really go into space? 
Wasn't that the eventual? US one wound up going into space. They went into space. Yeah, he became a space trucker. Which was yeah. like an incredibly DC thing I, to do. I thought it really was. It's um, but we but we digress. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe the only successful TV show I can think of from the late seventies that hasn't been rebooted or made into a movie is uh, BJ and the Bear. Oh it's God. clearly time. Clearly time. Yeah, I mean that, that even crossed over with Dukes of Hazard at one point. I think. So. Is it though, Chris? Is it? <laughs> well, listen. I when we were doing Sunday night show, uh, Jake Kovach was with us, and she 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 threw an interesting question out there, and I, I wanted to, to put it to the to the two of you because I I, I would love I'd love to hear Jason's answer to this, and I know Cynthia has a, has an interesting answer to this. Okay, uh, Jay asked us all, "What was your second choice? What was the other movie that you thought about writing about for the book?" And Cynthia, I know you got a great answer there, and Jason, want to hear yours? You want to go first? No, you go ahead. Okay. Mine was Monos, Hands of Fate, my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> yes, I know it's bad, but it's so delightfully bad. Um, I could write a whole book on that, let alone an essay. I love it. I've watched it hundreds of times, literally. Um, of course, at, at an hour and nine minutes, that, you know, is <laughs> as impressive a feat as it sounds. <clears throat> I have designed a card game for it that I really need to get. <laughs> done oh it's, it's fun. <laughs> oh well it proposes it puts it basically says what if things didn't transpire quite like they did uh so it fleshes some stuff out but anyway i digress um <laughs> but yeah you're trying to get out of valley lodge so yeah i love 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 that here's how much i love that movie shelly my life partner and i we took a trip now we live in southeast kansas we took a trip all the way to El Paso, all the way to there, just to go to the filming locations. We went to the filming locations, grabbed something to eat, went back to the hotel room, and went to sleep, got up the next day, left. That was literally our only reason for going. <laughs> it's not like we were just going there for other things and, hey, let's go here. No, we literally made a pilgrimage, <laughs> if you will, all the way to, to El Paso. I, I mean, it's kind of sad, I know, but uh, but yeah, I, I, that was my second choice. In fact, I'm hoping that this gets funded and we have another one because book three is it, Chris, that you have the idea I, for? Well, we'll 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 have we'll have to sit we'll have to sit and talk talk about it talk about it as a group. Yeah, but at some but at some point, I would just like to get into like just deliriously weird films, so you know, I can write about Blood Freak and other things that I've seen. How about like, Blood Junkie? Yeah, there you go. You see, the book the book's practically already written. <laughs> Jason, what was your runner up? I, I have to admit, I consider it at, at first Rob Zombie's The Devil Rejects because Ooh. Ooh. it really disturbed me the way that they flip your sympathies. That Rob Zombie, you start out being like, oh, oh yeah, the Firefly family, they, they really need to die. It's really terrible. And then you're, you're rooting for them against law enforcement by the end without them ever being any less terrible. Really. It's just, it's just they display actual family loyalty to one another, and, it, and it, it, it gives you some sympathy, even though they're the worst, most horrible people ever. Um, <laughs> and the way that... Um, what's his name? Uh, the sheriff played by who plays the sheriff in that uh william forsyth no sounds right is it is it william forsyth yeah i think it is yeah yeah how he slowly oh sid Haig's teeth don't normally look like that i, I mean <laughs> yeah. I look at one point but the way that that william forsyth slowly turns into a monster throughout the film mm. is 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 kind of great so uh it, it the film bothered me I love it, but it bothered me. I love the soundtrack, especially, but it, it it still bothers me. So that was my that was my other choice. See, it's hey. literally one of two of only. There's one of two Rob Zombie films that I like. So yeah, I, I really did enjoy that movie. Uh, is the other one the clown one? No, the other one's oh. Halloween. The the oh, first yeah. one, and I know it's controversial. I, I enjoyed it as an alternate reality take on Michael Myers. Yeah, I didn't he did he remake Halloween two or something? Quiet yeah. about that. Let's just zip it right there. Okay, okay. okay. There is All no right. part two. <laughs> um, yes, yes, he did. 
interesting. I thought I thought Lords of Salem was an interesting film, and a lot of people really liked it. I didn't like it, but it wasn't. It was interesting if you've seen it. I found it dull. Just that was yeah, my biggest complaint. Me, me too. But the critics liked it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I guess because he he did character development or some stuff like that. In it. <laughs> I, I don't know. And uh, Scott Connor's playing in. There is no Highlander or Hall- Halloween 2. <laughs> okay, there's no remake of Halloween 2. Okay, good. <laughs> and um, earlier, Sean Vera weighed in saying he's hoping for a volume on uh, film noir. I would be down for that. Yeah. My second favorite genre after slasher movies. Yeah, let's. Uh, well, I've already written one noir book that everybody hated. But I'm, I'm old. I may, I may, I may not. I may not care, Chris. I may not care anymore. I'm, 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 I'm 52. I may not care what my critics say at this point. We'll see. What, what, if we did noir, Cynthia, what, what, what film would you do? Asphalt Jungle. No hesitation. Notice there's no hesitation. Asphalt Jungle. 100. <laughs> percent I was thinking Blast of Silence. Ooh, Ooh yeah. yeah, good choice. Good. Now, I get. I haven't. I haven't thought about this at all. But I just saw the Blu-ray of uh, the RKO classic. Uh, they won't believe me. And I was just sitting there, like stunned, that even for film noir, the protagonist is a complete and utter shit heel. Oh man. <laughs> and I just, I was, I was sitting there trying to think, think like, unless you get into, unless you consider like either version of M to be a noir. I think. Do you have a worse protagonist in the history of the genre? If so, I don't know of one. Damn. I would like to call dibs on the man who wore plaid for the Noir anthology. Dead men don't wear plaid. Good one. Dead men don't wear plaid. Yes, I had the title wrong. I shouldn't. Dead men wear plaid. Yeah. Yeah. He was on a roll at the time. This is around the time he made the man with two brains. Oh, oh good man! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right around there. Yes, yes, in yeah, in that, in that range when he was doing films that people only realized they liked like forty years after the fact. Finally, they were like, well, "What the hell's he even doing?" <laughs> DOA classic, classic. Yeah, the, ori- the original one. Do the original one, not the remake. Yeah. yeah that's a good film. I would agree. Um, Chris, you know, a lot of us liked your Nord book from back in the day, just so you know. Well, I that that mean that means a lot to me. I just I just I, I have I have memories of trying to write time time of vengeance for uh, for that company and just and just being so depressed at the reaction on online that I could couldn't pick my head up enough to see the keyboard. <laughs> Cause I, I remember there was this one RPG net post. Uh, the guy was just, he was writing on a completely unrelated topic, and he just finished his post off. By the way, the, the new noir book really sucks. <laughs> like, what? This is so random. <laughs> the worst review I ever got was actually from Macabre Tales, which was generally a well-regarded game, but this guy, man, I mean, and I... I laughed my ass off so hard because it was so over the top. You really would have thought that I like beat up his grandma or something. It was, he was like, I'm offended that this game even exists. It's snobbery at its worst. Because what I did is I took out all of the influence of like Durlav and mm-hmm. you know all them guys, and I and I just stripped it down to Lovecraft only. And oh, he got so offended by that and other things. Oh my god. Did was, did you hilarious. did you ever hear about the review that Ken Height got on his Lovecraft comic book thing? For, okay, for those of you who don't know, the the industry legend Ken, Ken Height, who is blessedly one of the tr- contributors to Transgressive Horror, uh, through my good longtime friend Hal Mangold's company Atomic Overmind, did a superhero supplement based on the idea of what if Lovecraft would have followed his pulpy peers into writing comic books? What what would Golden Age comic books by H.P. Lovecraft be like. And and like all things Ken does, it's insanely well-researched and, and just full of imagination. They got a negative review from somebody who said, like, these completely betray the experience of the actual Lovecraft comic books. <laughs> what? No. 
you're talking about Into the Darkness, right? You yes. Into the Darkness? Yes. But that yeah, the has, guy was, sla the guy was slamming them because they were bad representations of these non-existent comic books. It, it has the fake <clears throat> collector's guide. Yes. The comics in the back. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, that was good. Woo. But they're not. But they're not fake. They're not fake characters. They're all the old Nidor characters. They're, the, the the idea was, what if H.P. Lovecraft didn't die of cancer and was it 43, 42? I don't know. 47. 47? 47? What if H.P. Lovecraft... 37, 37. Sorry, 37. 37. What if he just got really, really sick and he had a lot of medical bills? And so he has to go to work for Nidor Comics as a writer to like pay his medical bills off. Oh, and he wow. And he's doing it. That he talks all of his disciples like uh, August Derleth or or just like who who were his disciples? I'm trying to remember. Clark Ashton Smith. Yeah, 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 uh, and they all end up writing for pulp comics, but they're all still Lovecraftian. It's it's a great book. Wow. Yeah, I've got I, a little bit of me, uh, my, The worst review I ever got anything was given to me in person by Ken, Ooh. where. I asked him how, what he thought of my recent book, and he looked at me and said, it's adequate. <laughs> I have heard a great many Ken Height stories that had that exact tone. <laughs> I, I don't think you're the only one that Ken talks to that way, Jason, for what it's worth. <laughs> I've got, in all fairness, I've gotten good reviews from Ken, too, but not, not that one. Yeah. I had a guy somewhere, I can't remember if it was Golden Age or Silver Age, but he said the main problem here is the writing is too friendly. And I wanted to find his email and say, go fuck yourself. Better now? <laughs> All right. Well, hey, we have been, we just passed the 61 minute mark. And I've had a great time. I think this is a good, good jumping off point. Do we have any closing thoughts from anyone? Jason, Cynthia, Chris? Buy the book. Play. Buy the book. Get the book. Sorry, I'm stepping on your pimp territory. Pimp away, Chris. No, no, this is just my opportunity to thank you two wonderfully talented people for being a part of my little, hey, let's put on a show in the barn kind of thing. And you guys went above and you guys have, go, have gone above and beyond the call promoting this and trying to make it happen. And and just really, you you fundamentally did just a fantastic job of of, of my crazy little idea. So I really thank thank you all for being a part of this and working so hard and and just bringing every bit of your amazing talents to this and and God willing we'll we'll be doing this for a long long time. That would be nice. Thank and, you uh, for the opportunity. Also, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Wouldn't want to do it without you two. Absolutely would not want to do it without without all of you. And uh, I just need to say for anyone on the fence, um, we're picking up steam. We are over two thirds funded as of this afternoon. Uh, Sixty-seven percent when I checked the beginning of this podcast. So um, now is the time to jump on that bandwagon. And, ninety um, people, ninety people, and we can do this, and then and do many more. So um, the link is there. It'll be in the show notes, or just do a search for transgressive horror, or go show press on Kickstarter. Um, and Chris, you didn't remind me, but I will now play the intro music as outro music, and I'll give you a few more seconds to see. <laughs> You know, it's weird. The more, so I listen, the more I listen to it, the more it gets in my head, and the more I like it. I just don't, didn't want to stop there for a second. So. But um, hey, uh, Cynthia, Jason, Chris, thanks to everybody for coming out. Thanks to our viewers and commentators. It's always a pleasure doing this show. Absolutely. <laughs> we, we look forward to having you as a guest, Sean. That'll be fun. Yay! I feel like I almost know you just from your comments over the last few weeks. So. <laughs> I, I should let I should let him have this spot, and I should just comment on his show. <laughs> you can just get his, his his phone number, just text him throughout the day with random comments. <laughs> that can be the that can be the five hundred dollar tier. <laughs> you get McLaughlin's running commentary on. Well, well, our other possibility was win a dream date with Professor McGee, and I, I, don't, know, I don't know. We may be better off going with the phone call. So, all right, all right. Hey, thanks everybody for checking out. Check the Kickstarter, and we will be doing another one of these Go Show shows um, Sunday night, 10 o'clock Eastern, with Mr. James Lauder. 
And uh, so please check it out. Make the Kickstarter, and, and we'll surprise catch surprise guests. And, and surprise Chris, guests. The date thing worked for Brutus Beefcake, so I think you'd have a shot at this. So. <laughs> All right, I'll think about it. On that happy note, we'll sign off and see you next time, folks. <laughs>